Well, good morning. So we left off on Wednesday where we're looking at designing a new water treatment plant. We've been given a design loading rate and we've given the design flow rate for the plant. And we've been told some information about the client's preference in terms of the size. And this could be, it's likely dependent on the space availability. And the first thing you were asked to do is to estimate the clean filter head loss. So we've gone through quite a few calculations. We have gotten to the point where we have calculated the Reynolds number based on the geometric mean diameter of the particles for each size distribution. Uh, we've got the approach velocity that we've calculated and the viscosity for the temperature that we were told to use. So we've calculated R for the first um, set of data. Just make sure that we're good here. And this is <clears throat> this value right here. I'm sorry, this is this value right here. So we've used this diameter. And we can do this on an Excel spreadsheet, which is basically all of this data is from an Excel spreadsheet. So the next thing we want to do is calculate the coefficient of drag. So we will use the general form for the coefficient of drag. So we have the R values. So for this distribution here, we have that the coefficient of drag is equal to 24 divided by R plus three divided by the square root of R plus 0.34, and that's equal to 14.73. And we continue doing the same sets of calculations for each of these size. And the next thing we need is that summation term that's in our head loss equation. So this is this term right here, where we've multiplied CD times the fraction ret retained. So F is equal to the fraction retained divided by D, our diameter. And we will continue to use the geometric mean diameter. Again here, we have a coefficient of drag now of 17, oh, sorry, 14.7264. The fraction retained is the percent divided by 100, divided by the diameter, but we need this in meters. Notice this is in millimeters, we need meters here. And that is 390.3. We could do the same here for this here, and this would simply be 10.79937 times 2.2 .2 over 100. And we would divide that by the diameter, and that is equal to 84. So we continue to do all of those calculations, and then we will sum the values in this column. And we're using this equation here to calculate the head loss. And this is the head loss of the clean filter. So this is equal to 1.067, our approach velocity in meters per second, times the depth divided by the shape factor times G times the porosity to the fourth power times 
this summation, this value right here. And that is equal to 0.49. And your clean filter head loss should be less than 0.6 meters. So we are good there. Now, if that hadn't been the case, what would we do? Our only real options are to change the approach velocity and change the depth or to pick a different sand so that we change the porosity. Which as you can see, once we start operating the plant, the facility changing the porosity is not an option. Changing the depth is not an option. The only thing we can change is our approach of velocity, but that's dependent on demand. Now, once we've designed the filter, we need to calculate the backwash rate. The criteria for that is that we need to retain the finest sand grain. So if you remember, we have a depth of our filter we have the gullet here. We need to fluidize this bed. So when we backwash, we expand the bed. So we have depth of the expanded bed. We need to make sure that we don't lose the finest grand sand, grand, <coughs> grain, sand grains. We want the water to flow into the trough, but we don't want the sand to flow into the trough. So we've got that criteria. And then the other criteria is that we need to fluidize the largest grains to release this particulate matter. Now, the problem with this whole approach that we've been using is we can't use Stokes' law because the flow regime is turbulent. Your target expansion rates are at least 37% for sand and 25% for anthracite. And the reason it's less for anthracite is because anthracite is less dense. Um, back many years ago, when in the East Lansing Rodian Township plant, when they first put in anthracite in the, within their sand filters, they didn't calculate the backwash rates properly, and they actually washed out much of their anthracite. So they ended up having to rebuild their filters. This is costly. Um, they also had to reduce their backwash. The equation that we will use is that the depth of the backwash is equal to one minus the porosity and this is of the fixed bed times the depth of the fixed bed. So this is the uh, during operation times the submation of the filter media with expanded bed porosity. And we'll go through this calculation. The porosity of the expanded bed is a function of is a function of the backwash velocity and the terminal settling velocity of the, each of that particle grain size. And we'll use the Reynolds number, we'll include the shape factor in the Reynolds number. So let's go through the rest of these calculations. We again have the same set of data. So we have our grain size distribution and we have the geometric means that we calculated previously. Figure 8-7 in your textbook is a graph that allows you to estimate a particle settling velocity dependent on diam particle diameter and specific gravity. So the 
particles that we of sand that we have have a specific gravity of 2.65. This 2.6 is close enough, so we will use that. So what you'll simply do is you have a particular size. So for instance here, and we'll read our crust okay, to calculate or to estimate the particle <clears throat> of terminal settling velocity. So let's just, we can look at, we've got a diameter of 2.8. So that is over here. So it's 2.678. And this graph is kind of funky in terms of where the, so this is 2.05 here. So this would be 2.08 and we read up and we read across. So that gives us an estimated value here for our terminal settling velocities. And don't worry so much about um, estimating these all that carefully because we're gonna iterate on a solution. So this would be 0.28 here for example, okay. this next 0.28 here, this is 0.34. So this is our first estimate. And what I've done here is I've just tabulated that information here from the graph. So you can see for the particle size of 2.8, millimeters, I have a terminal settling velocity of 0.34. For 1.996, I have 0.28. So I go through and I count and I estimate, so these are estimated values from the graph. The next thing I'll do is I use that estimated terminal settling velocity to calculate the estimated R. So we've calculated the Reynolds number the same way as before. It is our shape factor times the geometric mean times the terminal settling velocity. So the estimated value divided by the viscosity of 1.307 times 10 to the minus six meters squared per second. And that will give us an estimated R value. We then can use that estimated R value to calculate the coefficient of drag. So we're just substituting in here. So that is equal to 24 over 603 plus three divided by the square root of 603.2 plus 0.34. And we continue to do all those calculations and that gives us the coefficient of drag for each of those particle fractions. We can then use the more general form of Stokes' law to calculate our terminal settling velocity. And notice we're using the same formulas that we talked about in sedimentation. So, and here, now we can calculate for this value here. We have four times 9.8 meters per second squared times the density of our particles times the diameter. So it's the, again, your geometric mean and in meters divided by three times my coefficient of drag times the de density of the water and this whole thing to the square root and that is this terminal settling velocity. And notice it's not much different from what we estimated from the graph. Now, 
we said that we need our terminal, our backwash velocity to be less than the terminal settling velocity of the smallest particles, which means that our terminal settling velocity has to be less than 0 0.0107 meters per second. I'm sorry, backwash velocity has to be less than 0 0.0107 meters per second. What you will then do is iterate on a solution. So let's start and we'll pick a backwash. Could velocity. you scroll up just a little bit, just for a second? Sure. So this is the backwash velocity of the smallest particles. And we want, we want to make sure that the backwash velocity okay, is less than that. When you're running these calculations, and if you go through the Excel spreadsheet, if you get negative values here, then, you, then your backwash velocity is too high, and you'll need to reduce it. So the next thing you want to do is calculate the expanded bed porosity. And we want an a expanded bed that's at least 37% greater than the fixed bed depth. So the equation we use here is that the depth of our expanded bed is one minus, the same equation I gave before, one minus the porosity this is the porosity of the fixed bed. And this is the depth of the fixed bed. This is the porosity of the expanded bed. And we calculate the porosity of the expanded bed using this equation right here. We need accurate values for R. So we'll use these calculated terminal settling velocities. So we're using the terminal settling velocities that we just calculated, and we'll calculate R as we've done before. So for instance, we've got 0.82 times 2.8279 times 10 to the minus three meters times our terminal settling velocity. So we're using the terminal settling velocity here in meters per second. And we'll divide that by the viscosity and that is this value at 618. So what we need to do is we need to pick a bed wash velocity. And as I said, this has to be less than that 0 0.0107 meters per second, the terminal settling velocity of the smallest particles. What we will then do is calculate the bed porosity, the expanded bed porosity for each particle size. So this is simply 0 0.010 divided by 0.3487 times 0.2247, obviously an empirical equation, times 618.6544 to the point of 01. And that is this value right here. Okay. We do the same thing. If you get a negative value, so if you get a negative value in step eight, that means 
your backwash velocity is too high. Okay, so in this case, if any of these values are greater than one, so if any of these are greater than one, your backwash velocity is too high and you need to reduce the backwash velocity. So for instance, if we had used a backwash velocity of 0 0.011, you would actually get values here greater than one. You'd have negative values down here and you'd reduce your backwash. So the next step is to calculate the fraction divided by one over your expanded bed porosity. So this is equal to 0 0.022 divided by one minus this expanded bed porosity. And that is equal to this value. And we will sum all of these values. Again, no negative values. If you have a negative value here, you reduce your backwash velocity. So then this sum from this column is what we will use. And then finally, we will calculate the depth of the expanded bed. And that is equal to one minus 0.45 times the depth of our fixed bed times the summation value from the previous page. And that is equal to 0.7251 meters. And we have 0.7251 meters divided by my fixed bed depth. And that is equal to 1.45 or a 45%. So we're greater than the 35% recommended, and we're very close to the GLUM recommendation of 50%. We're not quite at that 50%, but we're close. And you can see how we could increase that backwash velocity a little bit, but we need to be very, very careful because it's, <clears throat> calculations are very, very susceptible to a negative value and essentially washing out your <clears throat> fine sand. Now, each centimeter increase in water temperature means that we need to increase the backwash velocity to prevent reduction in the bed expansion. And that's as we increase temperature, we decrease the viscosity. So to counter that, if as temperature increases, we need to increase backwash velocity. For groundwater, that's typically not an issue because your groundwater temperature is fairly constant. If you're treating surface water, especially if it is a near surface intake, your temperature will vary significantly. Just to give you in Flint, when they were treating the Flint River water, the temperature varied over that roughly 18 months that they were treating from two degrees centigrade to 23 degrees. So they had a 21 degree centigrade change in temperature. And that temperature affects sedimentation. It affects the backwash <clears throat> velocity calculations, et cetera. You want to design for the warmest water that can be expected. And that's in order to size your pumps. As long as we have variable speed, we can reduce the pumping rate. We can then reduce the pumping rate so that we don't wash out our fines during the, <clears throat> the colder temperatures. 
and as I mentioned above, we, we want 50% expansion. <clears throat> now, if we were to increase this, if we increase our backwash velocity to, from 0 0.01, to 0 0.0101, 0 .01, we would get 50%. Sorry, this equals 36.4 meters per hour. And that would achieve 50% expansion. And our bed depth would be 0 0.749. So very small changes to go from 45% to 50. Typically what you will do is you will add 0.15 meters height to the weir edge above the undisturbed media. So you're providing an additional depth. So once you calculate your depth of your expanded bed, we're going to add 0.15 meters to try and ensure that we don't wash out the sand. And just to do one last calculation, at the point, 0 0.01 meter per second, we have bed a filter that's 80 meters squared in surface area. And I'm going to convert to gallons, but just to give you a sense of when we're backwashing. At points, point 0.01 meters per second may not seem like a, translate to a large volume of water. It is actually, we would, we were pumping almost 13,000 gallons per minute to achieve that backwash right here. And then just to give you a sense of how much water this corresponds to, that 0.5 cubic meters per second, if we treat Calculate how much water we treat in gallons per day. That is 9.5 times 10 to the 6 gallons per day. If we have to backwash three times per day for 10 minutes each time, that corresponds to almost, well, just over 380,000 gallons per day. And then if we divide this by the amount of water that we produce times 100%, that is 4% of our entire flow that we produce per day goes to backwashing. So we want to minimize the number of times we backwash per day if we can. And the amount of time that we have to backwash because that's using a significant amount of our produced water to backwash that filter. So all I've done here is just done calculated. This was our flow rate that we started and I calculated how many gallons per day that we produce just to give you a sense. So we're talking about 10 million gallons per day that we would be producing roughly. And then this is how much water we use every time we backwash. Or the rate, sorry, the, the flow rate when we backwash. So if we backwash for 10 minutes, three times a day, we're using roughly 380,000 gallons of water in that day. It's roughly 4% of our flow rate.
So any questions about filtration? So what measures would you take to limit the amount? You want to make sure that you have efficient sedimentation. The, the poorer the efficiency of your sedimentation basins, the more turbidity you're loading onto your filters and the more often you're gonna backwash. So it's really making sure that your upstream processes are working properly so that you can, you're not having to backwash as often. Other questions? Let's go back just to put this reminder slide back up here. So just to, I'll leave this up now as reminders. I'm happy to answer any questions too, but just a few reminders as far as what's due. Um, so the question is, does the backwash water then go back to the influent once the backwashing is done? If it is a surface water plant, no, the backwash water has to go typically to the sewer in a Groundwater system such as the Lansing Dye Plant and the East Lansing Meridian Township Plant, once they do some process modification so that they're not recycling surface waters from the sludge drying lagoons back into the plant, they will they are able then to recycle that backwash water to the headworks of the plant. So the dye plant, yes, it's a it's purely a groundwater plant. So you're able to backwash to take that backwashing backwash water and recycle it. So you're not losing that water. East Lansing, the way that their plant operated was that they have sludge drying lagoons, it's on your scavenger hunt. Um, and they, because those lagoons are outside, open to the atmosphere, it becomes a surf, it becomes a groundwater plant under the influence of surface water. So because of that, they, <clears throat> are unable to recycle that water. So they were doing process modifications so that they don't recycle that groundwater, that surface water back into the plant essentially, so that they will be purely a groundwater plant and then can recycle that backwash water. But surface water plants now have to um, discharge that to the backwash water to the sewer. There's very different rules really for groundwater plants and surface water plants. Groundwater plants, for instance, don't have to monitor disinfection residuals in the distribution system, surface water plants do. And the assumption is that groundwater plants don't have to maintain a chlorine residual in order to provide water that's potable. If not, have a wonderful weekend.